Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse. And by you, all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Sherry. I, uh, as we get started today, I wanted to apologize uh, for... Um, our lack of charging or batteries or something, our monitors aren't working today, so we're going to have to low-tech it today. No cell phones, no nothing. We just got to, we'll just do what we can. Uh, but we are here to worship the Lord, amen? Amen. Y'all stay with me. Let's pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I, um, I wanted to begin today's sermon with a pop quiz, and I know you all are just dying for those, because that's a, always my favorite thing, um, and some of the tools that you'll be using today, remember I had told you that these, this sermon series is very much like a Bible study, so you're going to want a Bible in your hand, um, there's some of the pews, um, and then I've also left some tools on the, uh, on the pews as well. There are these maps and timeline that I'll be referring to. But here's your pop quiz. Without looking, how many books are in the Old Testament? How many books are in the Old Testament? Is it 24? Is it 39? Is it 46? Or is it 49? 24, 39, 46, or 49? Those are your four choices. 39, I heard 39. 24, I heard 24. Okay. Wow, we're really tired today, aren't we? Okay. The answer is all of the above. It depends on who's responding. Our Jewish brothers and sisters will tell you that there are 24 books in the Old Testament, also known for them as the Hebrew Bible. Our Protestant brothers and sisters will tell you there are 39 books. The same books that you see in your pew Bibles and most likely in the Bibles that you're carrying around. Our uh, Catholic brothers and sisters will tell you that there are 39 books. And our Orthodox brothers and sisters will tell you that there are 49 books in the Old Testament. So, if you're confused, that's okay. But for the purposes of our continued sermon series, based on Adam Hamilton's book, Making Sense of the Bible... I'm going to compare our Jewish worshippers' Hebrew Bible, I'm going to call it that, the Hebrew Bible, versus our Protestant Old Testament. So, take a look at your Bibles and find the first book after which our Jewish friends call the Torah. So the Torah is known as the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Find the book right after that. That is Joshua. You should be on the book of Joshua. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. All right. Flip back a couple more. You see Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then you see one that says 1 Samuel. Yep. You guys there? Yep. Okay. You'll notice that there are two books that are named Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel. And if you keep flipping, you'll see that there are two books called 1 and 2 Kings. You see all that? Yep. Keep flipping. Then you're going to see two books called 1 and 2 Chronicles. You yep. see all that? Mm -hmm. Yep. You're a good ways into your Bible by now, right? Mm -hmm. Our Jewish brothers and sisters in their Hebrew Bible combine each of those books. So there is only one book of Samuel, one book of Kings, one book of Chronicles. Okay? Next, you see Ezra and Nehemiah. Are you with me? Yep. So you got Ezra and Nehemiah. This is my whole ploy since you all are already <coughs> tired to keep you awake. So I'll keep you flipping through the Bible, all right? So Ezra and Nehemiah... Um, are also combined in the Hebrew Bible. And so they are one book in the Hebrew Bible. Now, uh, take a look. I'll keep flipping all the way through your Old Testament. You'll get to Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah. See if you can get all the way back to the book of Hosea. 
Hosea. Ezekiel, Daniel, and then Hosea. Okay? You with me? Yep. Am I there? Hosea, all the way to the end of the Old Testament, which is Malachi, are considered what's called the Twelve in our Jewish uh, Hebrew Bible. They are all one book. They are called the Latter Prophets or the Minor Prophets, not because of their lack of importance, but because of their size. They're small books. They are combined in one book in our Hebrew Bible. So hence, the 24 books of our Jewish Hebrew Bible are the same 39 books of our Protestant Old Testament. However, they are in a different order. All right? So, we're going to keep going. You all with me? All right. Just say yes. It's okay. There you go. <laughs> so the process of including or excluding certain scriptures was a process known as canonization. That holy canon would become known as those books that were included in the Bible. And it's from that Latin word canon, which means rule or standard. And so determining which books were considered the most authoritative which means they would be then the best rule or standard for us to follow, that was not a clean and easy process. First and foremost, the Torah, we're flipping back to those first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, they ranked very high on the list of authority because they're considered to hold the very word of God that was dictated in stone and encased in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments, also part of that, that's, that's the, the part that was dictated in some, are, the most, uh, are in the most agreement as the highest authority. And so also included in those first five books, we find the covenant to God's people, along with the story of their delivery from slavery to the Promised Land. And so those books maintain this very high level of authority. There's, there's not a whole lot of argument about including those five books. But the next in line are the prophet writings. Now, we see these as the historical um, documents concerning uh, everything from Joshua, the book of Joshua, through 2 Kings. Our Jewish brothers and sisters will call these the former prophets. They include stories of judges and kings as well as those prophets Elijah, Elisha, and Nahum. And of similar importance then are those latter prophets, which I just talked to you about, those 12 books from Hosea to the end. Um, but they also include a couple more, Isaiah and Jeremiah in the beginning. And then finally we get to, so we've got the Torah, we have the prophet writings, and then we get to what they call the writings. These include stories of our heroes, stories of Esther and Daniel and Ruth. The writings also include 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, all thought to have been written by the same person, Ezra, after the Jews have returned from exile. And so I wanted to refer you then, see I'm keeping you busy today, I wanted to refer you to that timeline. There is one in every pew, um, and I gave these out last week. If you have yours, great. If you remember to bring it with you, awesome. Okay, so in your timeline, you see on the, on the bottom of the first page of that timeline, it says that the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed in 722 B.C. You see that? And then when you flip the page, you see that the southern kingdom, or Judah, was destroyed in 587 B.C., but the Jews were not allowed to return to their land until 538 B.C. You see that on the timeline? Just say yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So th this uh, becomes important because that's the slant then that Ezra writes these particular books in. Jewish rabbis debated up until the time of Christ whether or not to include some books in this section known as the writings. In other words, the writings were the most highly controversial ones, um, the, the scriptures that they had to, um, to evaluate. For example... I'm going to challenge each of you to read the story of Esther this week. It's a short book. It's a fairly short story. But you will notice that God is never mentioned in the entire book of Esther. It's not, God is not listed at all. And so the same holds true for the Song of Songs. But this book 
had an additional debate quality for its eroticism. While this book acknowledges the value of human sexuality, it's hardly something you'd really want to hear preached from the pulpit, I'm thinking. So, so uh, there's another one here that's also um, controversial, which was the book of Ecclesiastes. You might know one particular passage of scripture from Ecclesiastes because the birds turned it into a song in the 60s called Turn, Turn, Turn. And it uh, talks about to everything there is a season and every purpose under heaven. And you all know the song? Just say yes. You know? Okay. But the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes is that all life is folly. And so it was questioned then as whether or not it was authoritative enough to be read aloud in the synagogue. Proverbs was also questioned because at least two <laughs> Proverbs seem to directly contradict one another. We're going to look at those right now. So I'm going to get you to turn to the book of Proverbs. If you crack open your Bible to the middle, you'll hit about Psalms. Proverbs is the next book. Proverbs, and we're going to start and look at chapter 26. Proverbs 26. Proverbs are those little pithy wisdom, you know, literature, that kind of stuff. So Proverbs 26, we're going to look at verses 4 and verses 5. Okay? Proverbs 26, 4 says this, in my interpretation. Now, I don't know which one you all have. Mine is the, the uh, New International Version, and that matters. This says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. That's how my uh, interpretation reads it. Then if you look at verse 5, it says, answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Well, do we answer a fool or don't we? Um, it's kind of hard to tell, because it seems like these particular proverbs directly contradict one another. Now, it may just be because of interpretation. You know, this, this is the um, English, uh, an English version. It's not even the King James. It's, it's uh, you know, and so it's been interpreted from the Hebrew to the Greek and, and then into, eventually, into English. And so it could be that. But it does seem like they appear to contradict one another. And so the Proverbs were debated heavily about whether or not to include it. If that wasn't enough, because I'm sure you haven't had enough yet, right? Around 300 BC, a group of 70 to 72 Jewish scribes began the process of translating the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew writings, into the Greek language, which was the most common language of the day. And that work continued until around 100 BC. These writings became known as the Septuagint because that word means 70. That's the Greek word for 70. But this translation included 10 books that were originally rejected as not being authoritative enough by the Jews in the Holy Land. So after continued debate and a great deal of time, understand the passing of time here, the final decision to demote these additional books occurred during the Protestant Reformation of 1534. That's in this side of the timeline, folks, 1534. Martin Luther included these books in his German translation of the Bible, but he noted them as the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha, which means hidden. So check your Bibles. See if there is anything in between the New and the Old Testaments in your Bibles. If you get to the point where Malachi ends and Matthew begins, is there anything in there? If it's not there, you don't have the Apocrypha. And my, my uh, Bible doesn't have that either, but I have a study Bible with the Apocrypha in it. And so if you get a chance to get your hand on a Bible that has an Apocrypha, I'll bet you there's some out here in our library, you might want to read some stories about people like Bell and the Dragon, or the story of Susanna, or maybe even Psalm 151. There's an additional psalm in the Apocrypha. So at this point, um, I have just overwhelmed you. You all flip through your whole testament or, or rolling along here. So I need to ask the question. Who wrote the Old Testament? Who wrote the Old Testament? It reads and seems like a composite of writings from a bunch of different authors. We already talked about Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah most likely being written by Ezra uh, during uh, the time of when the Jews returned from exile. 
But many credit Moses with the writings of the first five books of the Bible. And it does appear that he wrote parts of these scriptures. But I'd like you to take a look at some clues that will tell you that it seems like somebody else had some writing in this as well. So let's take a look first. Back in your Bibles. I told you. I warned you. Uh, Numbers 12, verse 3. Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's the fourth book in. Chapter 12, verse 3. Let's look at that. Sorry, I'm flipping too. I didn't get all this marked. Yeah. My version reads like this. Now the man Moses was very humble, more so than anyone else on the face of the earth. Now does that sound like a humble man writing that he's the most humble person? It sounds like a country song I'm aware of. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Right? So would someone that humble actually be writing about himself being that humble? Probably not. Someone else probably had a hand in writing this part of scripture. Let's take a look a little further back at the end of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 34. So one more book back. The last uh, book of the um, Torah. Okay. 34. And I'm going to start reading at verse 5. Let's see how this goes. My uh, vision is interesting today. We'll see how it goes. So Deuteronomy 34 beginning with verse 5. You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Close enough? All right. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite to Beth Peor. But to the, this day, no one knows where his grave is. <coughs> Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the weep, time of weeping and mourning was over. I don't think Moses was that good that he could write about his own death. So it, it appears someone else had a hand in writing part of this scripture. And so um, I wanted to sort of um, revert back to a couple other things too. When you look at multiple writers, you're going to get different viewpoints of certain characters, certain situations. Consider, just consider, how differently um, someone uh, on one side of the aisle in our day versus another side of the aisle would be evaluating the same person. And I'm not going to say anything more than that. Um, but you can see that you would get a totally different slant on who this person was based on which side of the aisle they're coming from. The same holds true in some scripture. And I'd love for you to take uh, some extra homework if you care to. And look at the stories of King David as told in 2 Samuel, and then turn around and read them in 1 Chronicles. You will get a totally different viewpoint of King David. One sees him as the saint, and the other one uh, you know, bears it all, basically. So um, that's just an interesting... I'm giving you all kinds of homework today, too. You all didn't know that, did you? So, so far, we've looked at the books that were included in the Old Testament, the process for them being included or excluded, and possible authors uh, that bring various viewpoints and perspectives on God's relationship with God's people. But let's go back to one of our original questions. What is the Bible? What is the Bible? Well, last week we looked at what the Bible is not. And so here's a summation from the author of our series about what is the Bible. Let me just get to the right page here. What is the Bible? I know there's a lot of arguments and um, controversy over what, how do we use this scripture, but what is it? What is the Bible? This is Adam Hamilton speaking. It is first the story of the people of Israel and their faith in God. It is also a story about their God and his will and purposes for his people. It does not read like a book dictated by God. It reads like a diverse set of writings, short stories, law codes, court histories, poetry and prophetic warnings and promises written by people who were reflecting upon their story in the light of their faith. In the midst of reading Israel's story, we find our own story. And through their stories and their experiences and reflections about God, we hear God speaking to us. <coughs> we hear God speaking to us. 
Our scripture that was read for us from Genesis 12 is an initial promise of God to God's servant Abram that in spite of his old age, he's already 75 years old, in spite of his old age, a nation, his nation would be a great nation. It continues with a promise that Abram's children would inhabit the desirable land that became known and, and became the central focus for scriptural writings. Now I'm going to have you flip to something else. I'm going to refer you back to these maps. Do you see that in, in your packet here? Take a look at uh, maps number one and two in particular. We're going to look at this area. Do you see in the first map, there's a little dot on the map that says Israel? See it? It's a very small area, and yet that is the central area for the focus of Scripture. So you have to understand that this area was inhabited by the Canaanites, and it was desirable by the surrounding kingdoms. Look at map number two. We find the Egyptian kingdom to the south. Do you see that? Egypt below. Do you see that area that's called Arabia? Anybody know what that is? No? More coffee. It's the desert, the Arabian desert. You know, you've heard, it's a desert. There's, there's nothing there, it's just a desert. Look at the kingdoms to the north and east. You've got Assyria and you have Babylonia. You have all these kingdoms all surrounding this small region known as the Holy Land eventually. But you see that these, this area held the, the trade routes from these two continents. So it was a major trade route area between, each, uh, between Africa and Asia, in between those two continents. It went right through this highly desirable land. Everyone wanted to control it. Everyone wanted to control it. Much of our scripture writings occur somewhere near this valuable region that God promised to God's people. So all this gives you an idea of the focus of scripture and the focus of our writers, along with the timeline that notes when Israel prospered and when the nations fell and then the Jews were exiled and then allowed to return to their land. So we're going to shift gears a little bit here. And I want us to consider how Jesus looked at and read the Bible. Well, first of all, the Bible, this nice, neatly bound Bible, didn't exist in Jesus' time, did it? It just did. Just say yes. It didn't exist. It did not exist, okay? It was a set of scrolls. And I had uh, heard in one of the um, writings that the Psalms, because that's a large book, the book of Psalms <coughs> was a scroll that was 11 inches high by 34 feet long. So it's not something that you would just tuck under your, under your arm and, and stroll around with. It didn't go anywhere. It was read and expounded upon in the synagogues by the rabbis. It was highly likely that Jesus' parents were illiterate. And so Jesus then would go likely have to go to the synagogue regularly to study those scrolls. And we know from reading the Gospels that Jesus had his favorite passages, particularly from three areas, from the Psalms, from Isaiah, and from Deuteronomy. And if we look at that original breakdown of our, uh, the Jewish um, Bible where it talks about the Torah, the writings, and the prophets, he chose one of each. He chose one of each. So his favorites were from Psalms, Isaiah, and Deuteronomy. Last week, we read the passages concerning Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And each time, Jesus quoted scripture back to Satan. And every single time, it came from Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to look at one of those passages right now. Turn to Deut Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And I'm hoping you're going to hear some words that might be a little familiar. But you probably didn't realize it was, or you may not have realized it was in Deuteronomy. 6, 5. Deuteronomy 6, 5. We read these words. You shall love the Lord God. I'm sorry. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Sound familiar? Just say yes. Yes. One thing we can note about Jesus and Scripture, <laughs> he routinely challenged the religious leaders of his time to go beyond the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. Time and again, 
We see Jesus calling his followers to radical obedience to God. And with this goes hand in hand with Jesus' emphasis on God's infinite grace for the outcasts, for sinners, for tax collectors, for adulterers, for thieves, and believe it or not, for you and me. Even for you and me. So as we segue then into the New Testament, that's going to be our focus next week, I wanted us to refer to uh, a gospel lesson for today. And we're going to flip. It's the easiest one to find. It's the very first book of the New Testament, Matthew, chapter 22. I promise you we're wrapping up. I didn't see any happy, happy joy joys there. I think y'all are still asleep. Right, so look at Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse 34. Am I keeping you awake today, hopefully? Yep. Yes? Okay. Cool. 22 verse 34. We're going to start with verse 34. Find it too. And there it is. All right. Ready? See, you all found that one a whole lot easier. Didn't you? <laughs> Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus quickly replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. It is right there in the uh, New Testament. We're challenged to read, not only read and study Scripture, but to live it out in our lives as reflections of these greatest commandments. I wanted to thank Sue for sharing with us today because it is so good to see the results of putting our faith in action and the impact that we're making on our community. We are here to make a difference in the lives of our neighbors sharing God's love in every way we can. Love God and love our neighbors. Amen.